I'd lose a lot. I, my, my turnaround rate was like 25% when I was bidding on work because I don't want to say that the homeowners are at fault, architects are at fault for not fully understanding what things cost as far as customer goes because there's such a wide range. Welcome to Verify in Field, the Millwork Podcast. Your host, Jacob Edmund, CEO of Duckworks, will be interviewing experts in the industry to bring you insights and knowledge about the latest trends, techniques, and challenges in millwork. Whether you're a seasoned professional or just starting out, this podcast is for you. So sit back, relax, and join us as we explore the world of millwork. Here's Jacob. Welcome back, everybody. Today, we have Kevin Fastnacht. Did I pronounce that right? Kevin Fastnacht? Uh, Fastnacht. Fastnacht. Okay. There you go. Um, And he's owner of Fine Point Cabinetry. He's our guest today. And I'm excited to have a little bit of a different guest than we've had in the past. Um, Somebody more in the... Uh, residential side of things and and the creative, okay. doing a little bit more creative stuff. So uh, we're going to okay. talk about his background and what it's like, um, how he got into uh, running his own shop. Um, and he does some really interesting stuff with SketchUp as well on the design side. So thanks for joining us today, Kevin. Yeah, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm honestly honored to be on this uh, podcast. A lot of, a lot of uh, big guys on this, so it's pretty cool. Awesome. Thank you. Um, well, I think maybe to get started, um, give the, our listeners a little bit about your background. Um, you know, you have an education in furniture design and manufacturing, um, and you've got a journey of how you got to, you know, being an entrepreneur in this industry yourself. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, uh, my journey as a cabinet maker started out, um, actually in college. Uh, ironically, I didn't take any type of woodworking or anything. Uh, my parents, my father wasn't a woodworker. My grandfather wasn't a woodworker. It wasn't that traditional uh, path into uh, finding furniture and cabinetry. I found it in college because I went to school as an art major and I found woodworking uh, at school. So I think it was like my second semester in, I took one class and they, uh, my teacher immediately noticed I had a knack for it. And the dean of the art program owned a small wood shop the town over and hooked me up with him. So I immediately started interning with him, like second year of college and interned with him throughout my whole entire career of college, um, gathering a lot of credits, which was really awesome. So I didn't necessarily have to go to class. I was just going to work, which is really cool. Um, and that's where I learned a lot about the industry as a whole, just right from, right from there. Didn't learn, I wouldn't say learned so much in college per se. I got to cool, build some really cool furniture, um, graduated with the BFA in furniture design. And then my career kind of started from there. Worked there for a couple of years. Um, that was just a small shop. It was like a two-man show. And I was very much just a helper. I was, I can't tell you how many parts I sanded and how many boxes I just put together. Um, <laughs> and then from there, I really wanted to step out and kind of see a little bit more of the amateur world and went to a couple of different shops. Um, I landed at this one company called Full Scale Woodworking, which was a very high-end residential uh, cabinetry company that did um, like high-rise Manhattan cabinetry and architectural millwork. So I worked there for about seven years and that's where I learned everything I know today. Uh, that's when I really got a, a real taste of the super high-end world of cabinetry. And back to when I worked at that first shop, um, I knew immediately I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I always want to start my own business. So it was very natural that um, I was going to make that next step. I even kind of funny when I got the job at that place full scale, I told them in the interview that I would like to go off on my own one day. And I think they saw that drive in me right from the beginning and, uh, they uh, hired me and then I eventually went off my own. Um, and then when I started my business, I've been in business now for eight years. Um, I was concentrating like solely on, um, high end custom cabinetry, residential cabinetry. So, uh, it was, I wasn't really doing anything in Manhattan. I was tapping into the New Jersey market and that's where I'm from and, uh, did that still to this day, but primarily for the first three years, I was really concentrating on being a craftsman and being a cabin maker, um, realized I was working way, 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 way too much. Um, and then also not really having much in my pocket at the end of it to save for it. So I ultimately opened my eyes to a bunch of different opportunities throughout the industry. And I started uh, designing and selling kitchen cabinetry. So I am a dealer of a couple different cabinetry lines. Um, so these are larger manufacturing plants that they have a, a dealer like network that they sell their cabinetry at cost to. And I work with homeowners, architects, designers uh, to provide cabinetry for them on top of my custom stuff that I do. And now I kind of have like 
entrepreneurial ADD. Uh, so I'm all over the place of what I want to do, but um, now I'm kind of getting more and more involved into the engineering and shop drawing side of it to help out other cabinet makers. And I'm really interested in that right now because I feel like that's really what I'm best at. Um, I'd like to um, say that I'm pretty good at what I do and understanding and how I manipulate uh, uh, space. So um, it came pretty naturally to me. And so, yeah, that's kind of my whole career up to this point in a nutshell. Awesome. No, I think that's really interesting, you know, because I think there there are honestly a lot of people probably listening that can relate um, in getting into this industry through, um, you know, more finer woodworking education um, and, and a journey to entrepreneurship through working for a couple other people, but kind of always having that, that drive, that interest. I know I want to, you know, start my own business. Um, and you mentioned something there, though, that early on you were focused more on kind of like the the craft the the you know the finer details of like the the work that you're doing and mm -hmm. it wasn't ultimately as profitable as other work that you you've done since yeah. um it seems like there was kind of a a conscious transition there um can you talk a little bit more about that because i know there's a probably there's a lot of other entrepreneurs i talk to or people owning their own shops that struggle with that of like hey people don't we're competing against like inferior products Darks. and we, people don't understand the value, but at the end of the day, we're not making as much money as we'd like to. Like, right. I know there's a lot of internal dilemma that can happen there, right? Yes, absolutely. And I think I, it was a, a really big constant battle for me. Uh, I think one of my flaws to a fall is that I'm a bit of a control freak. So I like to, I, I never really had the intentions to scale to a large scale. And maybe when I first started my business, I was like the hopes and dreams of having a large mm -hmm. shop, like the one I worked at prior. Um, and then there was like a really harsh reality to that, um, uh, overhead costs and cabinetry is obviously very expensive. So, um, it's one of the, you know, one of the only trades that you need a space, you need very expensive equipment to produce all these things. And, um, I think I was just, I wasn't getting, uh, I wasn't having much of a return on my investment of my hours to really justify spending the money on the equipment that could expedite some of my processes. So um, that was really why I, and I, I was getting very burnt out. Uh, you know, I was working 12, 14, I, I, I've, I've worked 24, 36 hour days before to get projects on, on certain timelines. And I've had a couple of guys in here, I had a full-time guy for a little while. I had a bunch of part-time people in here. Um, and then ultimately just kind of never worked out. And currently right now I am just a sole operator. Um, and, but that's a real struggle when, struggle when you're trying to, you know, at the beginning, I was really concentrating on like perfecting my craft and really honing into what I was doing with my hands and kind of mm -hmm. putting a back burner on the business. And I was, you know, like when everyone starts a business, you don't really, not everyone, a lot of people, when you start a small business like this, you, you are, you are very much like the technician, like I don't know if you read the book, E-Myth Revisited, it's that whole mm -hmm. concept that the technician is really good at what you do. But when it comes down to it, uh, it's, you're not just, you're just basically creating a job for yourself and everything else becomes very overwhelming. And so I was very overwhelmed with the whole concept of business ownership while trying to literally craft everything with my hands. Um, so yeah, I actually hit a certain point at, I think it was like year three and a half or four that I, I like, I, I started, I went back to my old company for a little while, I went back and worked for them for about a month or two. Um, and, but still kind of continuing the jobs that are going on in my shop, but just trying to explore the concept, see if I, I really want to go back. And ultimately I realized after going back to work for somebody, I, I didn't want to give up on myself and I didn't want to just drop it and just go get a job again. Um, mm -hmm. and you know, there's a little ego in that, but at the same time, I just thought that's the best for me. And so that's when I had a couple of relationships um, throughout the industry with some kitchen designers that I was helping do installations for, and they ended up retiring and they did very well for themselves as kitchen designers. And they, they really implored me to explore that. And I did. So I became a dealer of a couple of different lines. And I, as I'm like really learning this side of the cabinetry industry, I learned so much about, you know, I had a very, uh, I don't want to say simple, but like you, you kind of get blinded, but what you know, and you, what you don't know, you don't know. Um, so I saw how the certain shops that I worked at did certain things and the three shops that I did work at all did things very similarly. And then when I became a dealer of cabinetry, you look at it from a very different perspective as like a manufacturing type of plant. And so, mm -hmm. and I never really saw cabinetry as that. Obviously in a lot of much of the world that you're in, it's manufacturing. Um, I was very much the craftsman. So, um, 
you know, I learned a lot about that and I uh, learned a lot, a lot more about business while working with them. And, and it just opened my, my eyes to how much more I could take on, um, how much more scale I can create by keeping a little small business. Um, and it's been working pretty well so far and I really do enjoy it. And I've developed a lot of new relationships because of it. And, um, I, but I also still get to satisfy my, my creative side. That's why I do this because I like to be a creative person. Um, and so, it, you know, it, it kind of checks all the boxes and it makes sense. Um, and, uh, I think with the shop drawing side of it thing is just me exploring other things that, um, I am interested in. And I think I'm going to continue to pursue that. And we've had conversations about the different software out there that I could kind of explore to do so. Um, but currently right now I'm using SketchUp, which is a rudimentary program, but it works really well for me at the moment. So um, yeah. it can happen. So, you know, and, uh, I want to drill in. Uh, uh, yeah, we're going to get to the software side because I, I, you have a lot of interesting um, thoughts to share on, on on that. But I want to drill a little bit more into this entrepreneurial side because you know, we talked about, okay, that you still get to uh, kind of scratch that creative itch, you know, now with, with jobs you take on. Because uh, I think a lot of people, a lot of people in this industry, like there's, there's a bit of ego to this, right? Of like, oh, well, I can't, I'm not going to be a dealer. I'm not going to sell those cheap cabinets. Or I'm not going to, you know, like, I think there, to me, these are my words. I think there's some ego there. Um, yeah. And, and I look at it the same way. Very much. Yeah. Same. And I think it's interesting, though, because I'm curious from your perspective, because what you just described to me is it's almost like you now have more creative options available to you with that as a, as a possibility. And, and maybe do you, would you say you get more opportunities that still include pieces within the job that give you that creative outlet that you wouldn't get otherwise because you're not able to also offer the dealer part of the job, if that makes sense? Yeah, no, 100%. It does. And I've done a lot of like, so a lot of the things that I've built, I've built a, a lot of different things. The main thing I focus on mm -hmm. when I start first around is I was like doing a lot of built-ins. I mean, that's like your mm -hmm. kind of standard cabinetry stuff that are really niche. So I, I continually do that. So what, what happens is I get, say, the kitchen component, but there's other parts of the space of the house that um, you need a little bit more finesse and a little bit more yeah. uh, fine touch to create certain elements. And that's where I come into play. So a lot of times I build like range hoods or kitchen islands or like one-off pieces uh, off of the kitchen, like a bar or something like that, that I could still kind of be hands-on and mm -hmm. um, be able to create, uh, to be a part of that project as a whole. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, as I've, I've, I've been doing this for like 15 years by now, and I've built so many cabinets, like just so many boxes in my career. And it, honestly, it gets kind of boring when you build the same things over and over again. And right. like to your point before about, I really look down upon uh, all those different manufacturers, like, oh, I'm so much better, like very much my ego, like puffing out yeah. my chest, like everything that I'm going to create is much better. But at the end of the day, I got hooked up with these really good manufacturers that produce very high level um, things. And there's also is really something to be said about um, not everybody can afford the super high end custom. And I don't, like my market, New Jersey is a, a very, very nice market to be in. Um, but not everybody in New Jersey has that type of money to afford super high end custom. So um, it really allowed me, I noticed when I was uh, bidding on work, I'd lose a lot. I, my, my turnaround rate was like 25% when I was bidding on work. Because I don't want to say that the homeowners are at fault, architects are at fault for not fully understanding what things cost as far as custom goes, because there's such a wide range. Um, mm -hmm. But now I could, you know, at least get 65 to 70% of the jobs that I'm bidding on because then I can competitively um, compete with uh, these other cabinetry shops without yeah. having to scale to that level. Like let someone else be the scale for you. <laughs> yeah. Now, I think that uh, uh, it's really important because I see a lot of people in this industry, they get frustrated and they like, you know, people just don't value good quality craftsmanship anymore. And And I think it's very easy, but a very slippery slope to start to vilify your customer base like mm -hmm. you start to blame them yeah. for not wanting to spend the money you want to charge to justify the work you're doing mm -hmm. when in reality like there's nothing you can do about that and they might value it but they literally can't afford it or it just they don't value it the same as what it costs to do that and that doesn't make them the villain right like you're exactly. ultimately trying to sell and, and either maybe you're going after the wrong customer That's base but like you said, there is a market for that work, but it's not necessarily the the base you're marketing to. 
or the, right. that is able to buy your product. I think it's also interesting because there's a very, there's a spectrum of, you know, for example, it's very common in our, in our industry for people to buy out drawer, dovetail drawer boxes mm -hmm. and nobody really bats an eye at that. Right. Um, and it, obviously everybody buys hardware, right. But there was a time where, you know, you didn't have drawer slides. You, you made them as a part of your drawer. They were wood. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, so it's, it's like, there's this spectrum of what we accept yeah. as, well, that's not an indictment on my craftsmanship because everybody buys slides. Okay. Well, that's not, that's okay because this component manufacturer makes really good dovetail drawer boxes. And then it's like, oh, well, I don't need to make five, my five piece drawers. So let me buy that out. But, oh God, I can't sub out my carcasses and, oh mm -hmm. God, I can't, you know. And so it's, it's interesting the things that we've accepted, but where we draw the line, you know, on what, what is acceptable to our ego, to a craftsmanship or not. Right. Right. And you could outsource almost everything. That's the crazy mm -hmm. part about this. I mean, you could be a one man show and outsource every component, box parts, literally yeah. everything. Um, and that was a really cool thing that opened my eyes to it because a box is a box. Granted, there's so many different ways you construct the box. And obviously there's qualities of plywood that are associated with it. Um, but at the end of the day, you're looking for a square box. I don't need to cut it. I, I just don't. Just, you know. yeah. Yeah. Well, and if anything, like as, as I think you've, you, you're, you're proving now is that it allows you to actually spend more time on the creativity and the problem solving and the design, yeah, right? Like you're adding more of your, your creative DNA to your projects probably now than you were before when you were spending so much of your energy doing the actual cutting and, and now you're able to actually creatively problem solve and you have more tools in your tool belt. Oh, I could buy this box from here or I could build this myself or I could combine the two. Right. Um, and a big so, thing was too, and like, like, you know, as, as a, when you are in a small business like this, especially cabinetry that you wear, like, you wear a lot of hats as far as the, on the, the building side of it. So I'm not just cutting the boxes, putting together the boxes, making all the fillers, ordering all the material, yeah. um, designing it, engineering it, but I'm also finishing it too. And finishing it was something that, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't learn how to finish when I was working at these companies. I was a cabinet maker. I was a bench guy. And then, and also right down to the installation too. So there's just so many small components to being a cabinet maker that it does, like you learn the process as, as you are a one man show, or you have a small business, you learn every step of the way, but there's a lot of learning curves associated with it. Um, yeah. and it, like I, I've learned that now I I'll finish some parts because I have developed a system that I work within, but like, if it's a large shop, I'm just not going to finish it. I'm just going to sub it out. It just doesn't make sense right. for me to do it. Yeah. And you start getting used to that. And it's kind of nice to not have that weight of doing every single part of the job, but it still still does come out to my standards at the end because I have that personal touch on it. Right. No, it's interesting. I actually kind of on that topic, I, I don't know if you, you're familiar with, but um, Nick Schiffer has a company, NS Builders, and he has a, a podcast, Modern Craftsman. And, and he there was a clip he posted recently. He actually did an interview with Mike Rowe um, mm -hmm. um, of Dirty Jobs. And, and Nick Schiffer was, you know, making the case like, hey, like, look, there are things in, in, as an entrepreneur, there's all these hats you wear. There's all these tasks you have to do. There's all these things. And it's like, you have to pick and choose what is the most important thing that I actually spend my time in basically delegate or arbitrage everything else. And he's like, today, like now we can, you can hire out the finishing, you can hire out your accounting, you can hire out these things. And there's people for every one of those things, there's companies that that's all they focus on. Right. Um, but I, I thought what was interesting, what made me think about, especially with him talking with Mike Rose, Mike Rose is a huge advocate about the trades and about, you know, this thing. And it's, it's funny it's to me because it seems like the pendulum is swinging backwards where for many, many decades, we've slowly begun to outsource and arbitrage manufacturing, like the dirty work, the dirty jobs, right? Mm -hmm. And focus to where, okay, we, we go to college, we, we focus on these office, these more uh, academic, like uh, are using our mental capacity, right? And our career and I think we're swinging the other way with technology and AI and all this stuff. Like it's very, it's much easier, especially with COVID now to outsource things that don't require you to be physically present right. and on site. Right. So you can arbitrage and say, oh, I can hire somebody externally to do my accounting, to do my uh, design, to do whatever. But now there's much more value to the dirty work, the physical install, right? You, you, somebody has to be on site to install that. And it's kind mm -hmm. of swinging back to where actually we are valuing what used to be the dirty kind of low uh, education, what we considered that way, right? 
Uh -huh. um, and it's almost like technology now is allowing us to kind of come back, the pendulum right. coming back. And um, another thing that to, to something that I think to be said about that as well, too. I mean, when you are like an owner of a business and like for me doing every aspect of, of it, if I, if I did have hopes and dreams of scaling, and I'm sure people are listening that would have starts are starting off small or have been, been small, um, but they do want to scale. It's good to know every one of these components of your business, mm -hmm. because if you don't fully understand, you know, every aspect of it, you're reliant on other people to take over those projects. And and when you are completely reliant on somebody else to say, manage your money, as simple as that, that's a big drop off. If you don't know how to do your own bookkeeping and you're completely mm -hmm. reliant on other people doing it and don't like, at least from, you know, 10,000 feet of understand what it is, yeah. um, then you can create a big problem for yourself down the line. If, you know, someone decides to screw you over or leave or whatever it is. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, that's one thing that I do kind of, I, I like to learn a lot. I like to fully understand what it is that I'm doing from every side of it. Um, and then, like you said, right back to it, then you could pick and choose of what you want to concentrate on and what's important for yeah. your business. What do you enjoy? That's another really important thing. What do you actually want to do within your business that makes you happy? Yeah. And so for that, like, as that's evolved, right, you know, you mentioned that you're, you're enjoying focusing more on the design and the shop drawing side. And, and, um, you know, obviously there's always got to be a balance to like, okay, what's profitable? How do I make money to keep doing any of this? But then within that, obviously there's, you know, do you find yourself consciously trying to think, okay, I'm going to do this job to make money, but I've got this one over here to give me personal satisfaction or kind of a hybrid of those things? Like, is there, how are you balancing all those hats and, and how do you think about that as an entrepreneur as well as a creative? Um, it's very, it's a big variable in that just because my work looks very significantly. So um, as work comes across my plate, I do kind of pick and choose of what's important and what do I want to do that day? <laughs> um, that's why I kind of spread myself out to uh, have a lot of different things that I do do because but, but not only does it create multiple income streams for myself, because that was a big thing that I noticed when I was only making cabinetry, that was the only thing I did. And that's, and if I wasn't working with my hands, I wasn't making any money and as simple as that. So the reason why I decided to take on all these other fields within my industry is that because it just allows me to create more income for myself. Um, so the juggling of it, um, I can pick and choose now that I know what I can outsource and what makes sense for me to outsource and what I can do in house, I can decide based off of the job, whether or not looking at my schedule in advance to fully understand that, is this a job that I could fully outsource to one of my manufacturers? Is this a job that I could outsource all my cabinet parts and all my doors and everything, even having pre-finished that kind of stuff? Or, or is this a job that I wanna, I'm really excited about and I wanna build myself? Um, right. and I know pretty quickly what, what that job is. And a lot of it, honestly, it comes down to budget too. So, um, I can pick and choose through the different manufacturers that I work with to hit different price points to be able to justify that this is this route that I'm going to go or that route. Um, uh, but don't get me wrong. It does get overwhelming. Um, when I take on a large job in my shop and I am manufacturing every component, um, I do see a fallout in other sides of my business which, which creates issues in itself. <clears throat> and, um, I mean, I'm fortunate to say that I'm, I'm, I'm always booked out for long periods of time. And I think I have a reputation at this point that for my quality and, and just how I interact with my clients, um, that it's, I'm comfortable with that. Um, but I'm sure if I wanted to, you know, take on more work and say yes to more things, um, you know, I would definitely need to bring on people to help me do that. <laughs> right. So yeah, um, it's, it's definitely a juggling act for sure. Do you find, um, you know, like, do you have strategies or approaches to continue to find satisfaction in your work? Like, so you mentioned that you have like entrepreneur sure, ADD right. and you kind of jump from thing to thing to thing. Right. Um, and I imagine some of that, you know, like is like that is allows you to scratch your create your you always want to be learning you always want to yep. be doing things do you find that you have to like reel that in from time to time, time and be like okay right. i really need to focus on making money for the next few weeks and so that i can then get back to this thing i'm enjoying of course and it's an internal battle that i have all the time um yep. i'm constantly like i constantly kind of see where do i want to be in five years where do i want to be in 10 years and what that's going to look like how am i going to get going to what am i going to do to get there 
Um, right. So yeah, you kind of have to put a curb to that creative side every once in a while. Be like, all right, I need to concentrate. I need to make money. I need to put my head down and actually work because yeah, owning a business, like it's, you can't constantly be in, um, you know, that foresight mode of constantly looking I, it, when you are a one man show, obviously if you have a big yeah. crew and that is your job is to completely uh, look in the distance of what your business is going to be. Um, but yeah, that's, um, yeah, it's, it's a tricky, it's definitely tricky to try to figure it and hone it all in to make it all work. Yeah. But that's some of the fun of being an entrepreneur, right? Is it, it is. Know, those are, those are the, the problems that, uh, we, we get to try to solve. Yeah, exactly. And I really, and I enjoy it too. That's the other thing I, 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 cause I do really enjoy what I do on a day to day. Um, and that, and I do enjoy all these different aspects of it. Um, so you know, right back to picking and choosing. It's like, what, what am I kind of sick of doing for a while? And then I'll say, and like the other thing, I like bouncing back to that shop drawing thing of it. It's like one thing that I'm really getting intrigued with nowadays is just um, using my brain instead of my hands, because that's another long-term thing that I have to consider with my career. I don't necessarily mm -hmm. want to be making cabinets for the rest of my career. I don't want to be lugging around boxes every single day. I don't want to be installing everything that I do in the long term. Um, so that's why I, I'm constantly kind of thinking for other things to creatively like use my creative, uh, outlook yeah. on things to create a, a small business within it. Um, but yeah, it's, it is overwhelming when I do, uh, I, I get like, it's like the writer, the entrepreneurial writer's block of like, what is this really? And, um, how can I make that work? That, that problem with that entrepreneurial ADD, I get to that point and then I just jump back onto my other thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So shifting gears a little bit to, to, to the design side to SketchUp, you know, you've, you've leveraged SketchUp and you've ultimately, uh, taught yourself, I think, you know, basically how to use it and, yep. and you use it for shop drawings, you use it for your own designs. You've mentioned you also help some other people, other, uh, cabinet shops with it. So one, how did that, how did that start? How did you first come to choosing and, and leveraging SketchUp? So when I first started my business, uh, I was doing all hand drawings, you know, uh, roller, uh, scale drawing. And I realized that really quickly that the moment a design change or you got to make multiple designs, it's all on pencil and paper. So you got to race mm -hmm. and start over. So I learned SketchUp the first year of my business because, you know, it was free. It was, it's a creative program that you could do line drawings in or three-dimensional stuff that was free. So I immediately clung to it. Um, and yeah, that was very much, um, I was watching a lot of YouTube videos. I was learning how to use it, the preliminary stuff. But um, my whole entire career up to this point was uh, very much in 2D. It was CAD drawings. I was interpreting my whole entire career. So mm -hmm. obviously when you're working with in the residential space and you're working with, say, the homeowner where they don't know how to interpret these prints, three-dimensional stuff is obviously really important. Um, so having that cap the capabilities of SketchUp to do, to work in three-dimensional space was really helpful. Um, mm -hmm. so everything, yeah, was really self-taught in the sense that, um, uh, I was learning how to use a program, but also at the same time, I had good relationships with my, my ex-employers and their draftsmen. So I, if I had a questions on how to lay something out and how to, how does this work? You would send me a couple prints and I'd use it all, a lot of them as just reference how to build my own prints. So, um, there's a lot of different ways to actually go about using SketchUp and you could draw it. Um, and I'm learning more and more about it now because I'm exploring different programs and also just talking to a, little, a lot of different people that utilize SketchUp uh, differently than I do. Um, you can draw in three-dimensional three space, but creating components and groups to create basically two-dimensional drawing based off of that three-dimensional drawing, um, which I never fully explored. I did um, in the beginning. I think I got a little overwhelmed with it because it was just me learning the program. Um, but, and also a lot of things that we're doing were not very complex and big. So I felt when I was trying to build things in 3D and create all these components and group them, it was almost more complicated than I needed to do in order to create the job that it was just a vanity. So I would just be drawing a two-dimensional drawing section cuts, details of it, and then just doing it, taking a box and just extruding it to what the vanity is going to look like. Um, right. And I kind of got stuck with that and I just went with it. And now um, when you work with architects, and designers, mostly it's uh, these two-dimensional things are well, all they really want, architects especially. That's really all they want to see. Is they want to see CAD drawings. So that's where I put a lot of my concentration in. So I use SketchUp and just parallel projection, top view, and just draw line drawings just like you would in a CAD program. Um, and, it, and it works really well. It, it really does. And 
Um, I've even had these conversations with my old grassland about, you know, that I've sent them prints of what I'm doing and seeing, you know, just, do you think this is enough? Do you think it, and I track my time, um, to see if this is taking me longer than it would with another, like with a cat or something like that. And it seems like I'm, I'm checked out and it's working really well. Um, so that's why I, I think that I see a little business in this because I just think a lot of people are in my shoes that don't really have the time or know how or want to learn how to draw. And um, I know a lot of guys in this industry, it's a very old school industry. So a lot of guys that are small, they're still doing hand drawings, drawing like a, literally a doodle of a box on a piece of paper and being like this width, this height and that depth and then make a part list out of that. Um, but the moment you step in kind of into the big leagues with uh, architects, that doesn't always fly. So right. I think helping out guys like that um, in a smaller setting, um, it could, it could be extremely helpful for them. Um, self a value add for them. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's, that's what was really interesting to me when I started looking at it. Cause I watched your, your, your stories and stuff on Instagram about it. And we, we talked a little bit as well. Um, but what's, what's interesting is you've essentially arrived at a way to utilize SketchUp as a 2d drafting tool. Mm -hmm. Um, in, 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 very similar way that we use AutoCAD as a 2D drafting tool mm -hmm. um, for the same thing. Um, and particularly, like you mentioned, the way you use 3D, I think it's the 3D warehouse, warehouse. to essentially as a block library, like you save your 2D details to that to be able to reuse them. So yes, you're using it as a 2D design tool, but you're not having to, like you're creating a library, a catalog of, of details that you're able to reuse components, and whether it's, it's you know, cabinet elevation or section or things like that so you're as that library grows as those details grow you're able to essentially be more and more efficient with your mm -hmm. designs i think right yeah absolutely and the, like ever this is a thing too because right back to the concept that there's so many different ways to make a cabinet so what i have done is drawn a couple of different shops that i work with they do things differently so i've drawn their boxes saved them plan side uh, front elevation um whether that's you know full level layer and set drawn you know, your standard, I, I now like I'm back to that whole entire thing, learning about the other side of manufactured cabinetry, I draw things in standardized sizes. So I'm just drawing a 12, 15, 18, blah, blah, and extruding it to the dimensions that I need it to be. Um, and then it just kind of sits right up in the dead space up in my drawing that I'm just pulling from constantly. Uh, that, and it really does expedite the whole process because in the very beginning, I was literally drawing every single line. And then I realized, why am I doing this myself when I, yeah. I'm just drawing the same thing over and over and over again? Um, sorry, I just started saving it. And same thing with like any components and, uh, you know, hardware and all that kind of stuff. The benefit of SketchUp is that uh, uh, SketchUp is compatible with DFX and uh, DWG files. So you can just download it from the manufacturer's website and just drop it right into it. Then once again, I could save it into my library as a component. And whenever I need that rollout, whenever I need that drawer slide hinge, whatever it is, I can just drag and drop it right in without having to look for it all over again. Or, draw, right. or just draw it myself. And then you're using layout to actually create the the, yep. the sheets, the drawings that you send to the client or yep. the architect or whoever, right? Yeah, and layout's a great program. It's really simple to use. I mean, like, I never really fully wrapped my brain around CAD. I took a CAD course in college and blah, blah, blah. But, like, I, I, I it's very similar um, in the sense where you could just basically drop a scene and then pull it to wherever you want. You could scale it to, you know, one inch uh, to a foot. Um, and just create multiple scenes throughout that one layout page and then just use it very similar to CAD. And I've sent these drawings to architects and other uh, CAD draftsmen, and they would never be able to know that I did yeah. this in SketchUp because they are almost identical. And you could create, you know, textures and all, like, you know, uh, you know when you're looking at it at your box, what that box would look like, the, the material would look like from the side section, like same what CAD would. Um, you know, there's just so many capabilities of this program. It's so it's such a simple program, but line drawing is really pretty simple. It's just, yeah. it just, you have to understand how to interpret a three-dimensional something into two-dimensional space. Um, but once yeah. you can kind of, if you have that brain to work like that, it's really easy to use. Do you have any advice for, you know, other maybe, uh, solo cabinet guys like yourself that are, are trying to solve that problem? Hey, uh, you know, I, I know I. I want to be able to do shop drawings or I, maybe I'm bridging into this. Um, 
you know, about, about how they can get started or think about getting yeah, uh, the me. ability to do shop drawings. Yeah, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, it's, uh, there are so many YouTube videos uh, of how to use this program. Maybe not, honestly, there's probably not a lot of YouTube videos on how to draw in two-dimensional space, but there's two things that are important. It's it's parallel projection at the top. And, like, and that's really all you need to know. They're just drawing lines, as simple as that. Um, but yeah, you can find everything. SketchUp, is, they, they've created such a cool library of, of tutorial videos that you can go in and check and if you don't know how to do something. And I still do it from time to time, uh, just because like, well, how do I, uh, you know, uh, how do I get this to divide out into equal space? I did that um, uh, recently and I realized it was a simple um, equation to do. Uh, so there's lots of information out there. And that's what the best part about SketchUp is that it's super cheap too. So if you do want to get into start drawing your own shop drawings, you don't have to buy it. It can be free. But if you do want to buy it and you buy SketchUp Pro, it's only $350 a year. I mean, a lot of these yeah. other design softwares, I, I own 2020 for about two years. I, I was annoyed by it because I come from the custom world and it's very just generic plug and play dropping, you know, these uh, pre-manufactured cabinets and throw a catalog into it. Um, but it's in that, that program costs, you know, 18 under a year or whatever it is. Um, you know, so it's really easy to get your feet wet uh, with this program, and it's really obtainable to learn. You just have to, if, if you build cabinets, you understand how things get to built. So just draw them how is it that you would build them. Simple as that. Right. Awesome. Um, well, uh, shifting gears a little bit, there's, there's two questions I like to get, uh, ask every guest. I'm curious on, from your perspective. Um, one, what changes do you see having in our in industry over the next five to 10 years, um, you know, whether it's around the design and manufacturing processes or the business in general, like what do you, what do you see happening over the next five to 10 years? Oh, uh, so, you know, obviously my, my school small scale approach here compared to what you normally work with in commercial scale. So, uh, especially the small scale, um, shops were very slow to pick up to what everyone else is doing. So I do really see, um, over the next, you know, five to 10 years that these smaller shops will start incorporating more um, CNCs into the business and more automation, and also utilizing a lot of these design softwares to make the lives a lot easier. Because um, as we all know, there's a bit of a labor shortage and a lot of people, a lot of people are not coming into the younger generation, just not coming into the industry. So you need to figure out a way to be able to, you know, create what you want to create without having the manpower to do it. So I really see a lot of value in these CNC machines for smaller shops. Um, and I've talked to a lot of people that are already acquiring and I, and I can see the margins that they're working with and because of it. Because if you think if you buy a CNC machine, if you, you know, the, the starter CNC machine shop saver for fifty sixty thousand dollars $60,000, I mean, that's one year salary that I got to pay once, you know, mm -hmm. instead of an employee that, you know, that would be a large overhead cost for a long period of time. Um, and so I really think that that's going to be a, a big helper for the small shop industry. And then uh, I think another thing would be like the finishing components. I think that's a really large shift right now that's happening and it's ha been happening. And I've been dabbling with his uh, water-based finishes versus solvent-based just because we want to protect ourselves. So, you know, we breathe in a lot of crap being a cabinet maker. Um, so I've made the switch. Um, I still use solvents periodically depending on the time of the year. I live in New Jersey, so it's really cold and we're using water-based products in the winter time can be kind of difficult and not a very controlled environment, which my shop is not very controlled. Um, so I think that's going to be a big shift and they're just improving it and changing formulas so often that, um, I, I just picked up a new one that is sprayed immediately. Um, fantastic. Whereas eight years ago when I first tried water-based, I can't tell you the amount of variables that were in play and trying to spray this stuff and how many issues I was having and how it just wouldn't last as long as say a conversion varnish. Um, so I think that's going to be a big shift. And I think real also, I think that states are going to go start cracking down on VOC levels too, because Canada already did it and California did it. And I'm sure there's a, a litter of other states that have already been cracking down on it. So, um, and I don't want to say that Water base is definitely the safest thing in comparison. It's much safer, but there are still toxic chemicals and resins within water base. So if you are going to be switching, obviously, don't just spray as if you're just spraying water. Still wear proper PPE and respirators to protect yourself. It just yeah. doesn't off gas like uh, solvents do. Yeah. Awesome. No, I think that's huge. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's something that definitely has already started in the commercial side, and there's a lot more 
resources for it, I think at that scale, but yeah, um, I know, especially, you know, the health side of it, just like you said, for, for you and, and thinking about it, I think is a, it's hard to quantify. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, well, on the flip side, what do you think will remain constant and, and stay the same despite, you know, those changes in our industry? Um, you know, so right back to the, the lack of help in this industry and the lack of kids coming in, the younger generation coming in, I think that will eventually switch. And I, th I think that people will always want to build things with their hands, no matter what, we're just creative as general of people. So we're always going to want to build, uh, you know, it's like, as, as long as the tree grows out of the ground, we're going to cut it down and build things out of it. So, yeah. um, I think that, that there will be a continual influx of say the Gen Z's that will be incorporating into, um, the cabinetry industry. It may not happen overnight, but it's that whole concept that, you know, when there is a shortage, um, if they are smart, um, they will see the opportunity and you, there's the opportunity to make a lot of money within it. So I think the people will still come. Um, and, and also on the small scale too, like I was saying before, I think that people are relatively stagnant in learning new things too. So five years, I don't think much is going to change for, for the small shops, just because like for, for me, for my instance, I have machinery that is 40 years old and it still does the job fantastic. So, um, yeah. the one thing that I think that will still be around of all those old equipment and the way you build things, it just cabinetry is relatively simple in that sense that not a lot has changed in a hundred years and it will continually be the same, um, right. just maybe different methods uh, to get there. Awesome. Well, Kevin, I really appreciate you taking time to come on here and share about your story, share about some of your expertise and your experience. I think there's, I know there's a lot of people that are going to gain value from this. Uh, if anybody does want to reach out and find out more um, about getting you to do shop drawings, about the way, you know, you do what you do, how can they, how can they follow you? How can they connect, contact you and find out more? Uh, probably the best way is Instagram. Uh, it's fine underscore point underscore cabinetry. Um, I spend probably too much time there. So, um, I'm always readily available in DMs if you want to reach out and chat. And I honestly, I love talking to people. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of this is kind of, I guess why I'm on this podcast too. I, I really love interacting with other people on the trades because, you know, as a sole entrepreneur, um, you do get kind of lonely <laughs> when you don't have people to bounce ideas off of. So I really yeah. like the community that I have, uh, uh, built uh, through the Instagram pl platform to communicate with other tradesmen, and other craftsmen. Uh, so it's, yeah, feel free to reach yeah. out. To Definitely. If you're not, uh, go, go give Kevin a follow. He, he produces some great content over there. That's how that we ultimately got connected with through Instagram. Um, and that's a whole other topic. We, you know, I'd love to pick your brain about maybe on another side is, is Instagram and marketing. Cause I think you've done uh, uh, a killer job growing an audience there and, and showing your work and, and putting it out there. And I think that, um, the, the reward you know, is, is obvious that it brings you business yep. and it, it's helped yep. you with your business. So, it really um, is. awesome. Well, I'll put a link to that in, in our show notes. So it's easy for you. If you're listening to this, you should be able to go click the show notes and go right to his Instagram. Um, and again, I appreciate having you on Kevin. We'll do yeah, it again Thanks soon. so much for having me. Really appreciate it, Matt. Thanks. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Do you want to stay up to date about industry insights, new content, and our community of mill workers? Go to duckworksmw.com to sign up for our newsletter. I'll see you in the next episode of Verify in Field.